And everybody else was sort of just like, you made me a bikini out of pantyhose and actual like preserved chicken wings with feathers. Like, how could I say no? We're dreaming the world to come. Spiraling in time. Dreaming alive. Dreaming alive. Dreaming the world to come. Dreaming alive. Dreaming alive. Pity we hear our song. Hi, I'm Baloney. And I'm Shmageggy, and this is Awakening the Outer Space of Ancient Times. Times. Ancient Times. <laughs> this is the Awakening of the Outer Space of Ancient Times, a cesspool of bad ideas and terrible mistakes where we dishonor the short-sightedness of worms and their mothers doing the horror through climate chaos with cod liver oil milkshakes. Our goal is to enclose people in capsules and force feed them lies of the state while stealing all their black hoodies and cutting them off from vegan options. <laughs> Baloney and I are luminous bulbs of soon to be shattered orbs of light, drenched in battery acid and living in a constant state of anxiety here in hyperspace. We wear hyper colored crop tops that show the temperature of our armpits at all times. We are totally disinterested in the conception of time or seasonality, and we create nothing. Forget you ever heard this. This doesn't exist. Welcome to our episode for Dar and the Holiday of Purim, where you forget everything you know. May this be one among many strategies for liberation. <laughs> <laughs> so shmageggy yeah. i'm just wondering are we still gonna talk in our voices <laughs> what are your I... associations <laughs> with the door i don't know if i can keep it up the whole time i don't uh... think people will want to listen to that yeah <laughs> <laughs> but what are your associations with the door my associations with Adar, I mean, the first thing I think of is those metal groggers. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> plastic so. handles that sometimes worked and sometimes didn't work. <laughs> uh-huh. And make a very annoying sound. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and definitely homentation. Mm. And I have memories of making homentation in, like, nursery school. I went to Aww. nursery school at the JCC. And my You're... grandmother's favorite homentation were the poppy seed kind. Oh, yum. Those are good. Mm -hmm. They're really good. I tried to make them a few times as an adult, and they were much better than when I had them as a kid. Oh, nice. I made some last year. I'll have to do it again. I Do you remember when I was denied having my Purim Spiel flyers printed at a local print yes. shop because they thought they were too obscene because yes. there was a giant hamantaschen in the middle of it. <laughs> like a vulva, which was kind of my point. I was like, it's a cookie it's for a religious <laughs> event. <laughs> yes, it's so awesome. And they're I... supposedly modeled off after the hat that Haman wore, but um, also... I think a lot of people are like, this obviously looks like a representation of the divine feminine. Obviously. <laughs> Clearly. That's what it is. Yeah. 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 I, my, I mean, my more recent associations as an adult is with Purim spiels and mm -hmm. queer expression of joy and absurdity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, our, in our communities. Yeah. yeah, and I've had the opportunity to come into myself in certain ways through Purim Spiels as an improv actor and actor. Mm -hmm. Really mm -hmm. enjoying that. I have a and hard dancer. time. <laughs> and a dancer. Yeah. Well, I knew I was a dancer. I just hadn't performed as a dancer right. so much. Right. Um, but I, I think that 
Um, gosh, I totally forget what I was going to say. <laughs> it's because I'm wearing these. I'm, I'm going to take this off. <laughs> I'm wearing a um, variety of uh, physical therapy rubber bands. Uh, <laughs> As your wacky Purim costume. <laughs> yeah, that was my impromptu Purim costume. Um, well, maybe I will. It's a little more comfortable. Take this off my head, my head, too. <laughs> um, well, I wonder if we should try to tell just like a really simple uh, Purim spiel, I guess. Um, mm. Just like, what is the story? Yeah. So that people who aren't familiar know. <laughs> yeah. So. Okay, the basic, simplest way to state the story is that there was a king who liked to get drunk all the time and party. He had a wife who was named Vashti, mm -hmm. and he told her that she needed to come, like, dance naked for his him and his friends, and she was like, no. Mm -hmm. And so he kicked her out. So yes. that's all we hear about Vashti in that story, except that we always attach to Vashti and, like tell more about who she might be. There's some speculation that she had a tail that's in some of the Talmud. Talmud. Yeah. 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 She's really talked down in, in the Talmud. They compare her to a nettle. Mm -hmm. and, and so I've reclaimed Vashti as queen of nettles because mm -hmm. she's awesome. And, and nettles so are nettles. Awesome. And she yeah. has good boundaries like mm -hmm. nettles yeah. do. And she's really nutritious and good for us to learn about those boundaries like nettles mm -hmm. are. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that beautiful framing of Vashti. <laughs> and also, you know, I think the, the fact that she's talked about as having a tail just makes me think of her as somebody who's potentially trans or mm -hmm. has, you know, a non-normative body. And... Um, so, like, those of us who are disabled or queer or trans might relate to her in those ways as well. And, um, yeah, and just, like, the thing of just, like, having people want to spectate your body when you don't want to be. And so, anyway, this is yeah. not the simple version of the Purim Spiel. This is a deep dive a little in bit into Vashti. <laughs> um, one of the most interesting characters in the story. For real. For real. So then Vashti's gone and the king is like, well, I need a new queen. So then it's like, well, all of the beautiful maidens of the land come to the castle so that the king can choose the best one to be his queen. And so then there's this guy, Mordecai, who is Jewish and he is rebellious. I always really like attached to Mordecai when I was younger because he like wouldn't bow down and said, mm -hmm. Jews only bow down to God. Um, so that felt like this like anti-authoritarian spirit that I associate strongly with my Jewishness. Um, mm -hmm. Let me take this thing off. It's too scratchy. I'm wearing this like gold <laughs> like... spark sequined scarf. <laughs> We're like, we need to throw on some Purim garb real quick. Okay. Yeah, so then Mordecai has a niece who is Esther. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's like some reference to Mordecai having breastfed Esther. Oh, yeah. So then there's, like, possibly Mordecai was also trans, or at least gender transgressive. Um, mm -hmm. And he raised Esther, and she is, like, a young maiden. I'm guessing she's probably in her teens. And he's like, go to the castle. Maybe you can be the queen. And then you can, like, advocate for our people. So... She's like, oh, my God, I, like, never thought I would have to be in this position. Actually, that comes later. But she goes to the castle. She is chosen as the queen. And then, do you want to introduce Haman? <laughs> yeah. And then, well, I'll just have to share what I remember. Yeah, yeah. Offhand. <laughs> because, honestly, I remember the story more not exactly how the story goes, but from all the <laughs> Purim spiels. The weirdo Purim that, places. Yeah. That <laughs> <clears throat> so Haman is the king's, like, advisor. Like, advisor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Haman gets this idea that all the problems, of course, this is what always happens, that are going on in the kingdom should get blamed on the Jews. And there's this plan to exterminate Jews. And then Esther's Jewish. So she hears about the plan. And the big thing that Esther does is she comes out 
as Jewish to the king and kind of saying like, well, you can't kill the Jews because I'm a Jew and I'm married to you. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of Esther stepping into her power. and Yeah, and there's all this stuff about the process that Esther goes through and how careful she is and how and when she approaches the king because she knows she has proximity to power, but also, like, he has the power and she could be punished if she, like, does it wrong. So mm -hmm. she, like, holds these feasts or these banquets. Right. And, um, and then, oh, and then there's this whole thing where... Like, the whole reason that Haman is like, I want to kill all the Jews is because of Mordecai being like, I'm a Jew, we won't bow down to you. Mm. So he's like, well, fuck these people. And then there's a part that it's like, they're not killing the Jews, so they're going to kill Haman. Yes, it is true that in the end, at the almost end, in the place where we usually stop the story, is that Haman is hung on the gallows that were built for Jews to be hung on. Mm -hmm. But then, after that, there's actually, like, a total ramp of revenge and all these other Persians are killed in like retribution. A lot of people got killed after this. Yeah. So there's this, and we usually kind of skip that part of the story and focus on like, oh, there was this threat and then it was averted and like that's what we celebrate and relate to. But then there's also this piece about revenge that is sticky and yucky feeling. Like, why is this a party? Like, this is a kind of horrible story in a lot of ways. Mm, yeah. Well, it, I'm also thinking about, you know, it, Yishak Ofori Solomon in our second episode taught us that other times in the world where there's oppressive moments where the Jews are being oppressed and they overcome the enemy is called a Purim. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so like using the Book of Esther as a reference to celebrate survival in the face of oppression, yeah. You know, both Purim spiels that I've written in the past five years, Haman was like a Trump caricature, and then the king was like George Washington, basically. <laughs> and then the last one I did, Esther was like Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, and then inserting characters like one of... Um, one of AOC who is called Esther Olamim Hakohenet. Like one of her advisors is Shoshana Avrams, which is like a Stacey Abrams character and mm -hmm. just figuring out ways that what we're currently dealing with in the world relates to the story and kind of drawing that out. So yeah, I mean, I feel like that is what we're still currently doing and it's cool to know that that's something that people around the world have done to celebrate survival and have a reason to party. More party. More parties. Sure. I mean, a big part of it is that you dress up in costumes as characters from the story or just whatever. And then you are supposed to, like, make a lot of noise and boo and shake your groggers whenever Haman's name gets said. And you're supposed to get so drunk that you can't tell the difference between the good guys and the bad guys. So that mm -hmm. then you're, like, booing Mordecai and cheering for Haman. Because it's supposed to kind of, like, shake up the hardness of, like, moral rules. Yeah, I, um, for the planner, we connected the Myrtle plant with the month of Adar. Another name for Esther is Hadassah, and Hadass is Myrtle. And it's a really, such a sweet plant that stays green throughout the year. So it's, it's something that's staying, smelling beautiful, even as the last of winter is finishing and just the mm -hmm. winds of spring are coming. I also feel like the nativa of the month of Adar is very significant. The Netiva is like a archetype and it's the Leitzanit, which is the sacred fool. I feel like that is like both our own playful energy. It's also like interruptions, things that make things not go the way that we want. And I feel like there's been some like kind of intense, I don't even know. It does feel like Leitzanit, but a little bit of like ouch <laughs> um in this past month or so of like this podcast is going to be coming out pretty late and oh, it's yeah. because we've both been dealing with health issues and mm. just like thing after thing happening where it's just we needed more time and 
And then we were like, had to give away 18 boxes of planners. Of planners. That felt like super late to neat. There were 18 boxes, eight, which is, you know, 18 is Kai. And we gave them away because our shipping situation has changed and we know we can't sell that many. You can still buy them on our website. And please do. If, Support yeah, us. Please do. We it's, still have 300. <laughs> yeah. Really helpful to us. But also, there are 18 free boxes of books out in the world. So if you know someone that has one, ask them for a planner. <laughs> yes. Both and. <laughs> both and. But yeah, just, I feel like part of it is like, oh, it's like that saying of like, we make plans and goddess laughs, or, uh-huh. you know, it's like, oh, I really wanted things to go this one way and they didn't. That's that kind of late and neat. Yeah, that's kind of the theme. Energy. We're like in a late sunny theme year for Dreaming the World to Come. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, kind of. We are having fun. I'm like, we should have more oh. fun then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we should have more fun. Dream is alive. Dream is alive. Dream in the world to come. All right. Oh, my God. Hi, Alana. We made it into this room together. Yes. <sighs> Thank you for all of the effort that it took to make this moment happen. And it feels really good to be able to connect with you. I think it has been a while since I've like spoken to your face in this way. Yeah. Thank you. And I heard a rumor a minute ago before we started recording that this is your first podcast. This is my first podcast. This is my podcast, Cherry. Um, I'm very <laughs> excited. I um, am really treasuring my cherries at the age of 41. It feels really exciting to still have them. I've also, yeah, the, the short list of other things I haven't done are probably too risque for this forum, but it is, yeah, it's really exciting to have things that I haven't done. And thank you for um, inviting me to do this podcast mm. and pop this cherry. Adar is a, mm. is a cherry popper, so. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. And up. also we encourage risque things. So if you, <laughs> if, you know, don't hold back either. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's or maybe a I'll say, maybe it's, I'll, a it's true. It's true. Maybe I'll say my list might not be too risque for this forum, but it might be something that I want to reveal more privately. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going to read your bio, and then we have some questions for you, and also it could just be really free form, because often just by talking, you'll answer the questions. So, thank you, Alana June. Alana June's life work is dedicated to realigning texts and traditions towards healing and collective liberation. Alana Jean currently lives in Lenape Hoking, New York, where she teaches at the Brooklyn Waldorf School and celebrates with a wide and wild web of queer Jewish witches and other wise ones. Learn more at alanajune.com. We're so excited to have you on the podcast today, and we wonder if you want to start off and just share anything about your contribution to the planner. It can be just kind of where you got the idea or anything about Adar and Purim or the ritual you offered. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you for having me. Yeah, it was it was a very interesting exercise to try to write this piece about Adar because, it, you know, it, it felt a little bit like, um, you know, you just read my bio, right? And it's like, how do you write in two sentences, like your biography or like who you are? And, and it's sort of even harder to write that about somebody you're really close to. And I mm-hmm. felt that with Adar where I was like, you're so many, you're so, you are so much and you are so many, and we have been together so many times. And I always look forward to when you're, you know, on your way. And I, and then I also get nervous because you're coming. Like we've, I've like been with Adar so much. Which is why we asked you to write for Adar. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you for the invitation. And it was really amazing, like to try to exercise that muscle. Um, So I, I will say, I have this uh, this living question that will never get answered, which is like, which of these two festivals actually like brought me onto my path? Was it Purim or was it Passover? 
to, to go out wide, there was a, at this time in my life where I had decided that I would not be Jewish anymore because I could not figure out how to be Jewish and keep the rest of me in the room. Mm -hmm. um, I did not have queer Jewish community. I did not have anti-Zionist Jewish community. I didn't have radical feral Jewish community. And I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't even know if those ex communities really existed. Mm -hmm. And I had sort of, yeah, decided that I, I wouldn't really be Jewish. And, and yet something kept calling me back. Like Jewishness kept being like, basically like, you don't really have a choice this one, mm -hmm. you know, like you do, you do, you mm -hmm. can practice or not, but it's much the same way that I've come to think about Jewish time. It's like, you know, right now we're in the month of Shvat that we're doing this, this talk, but it's like right now we're in the month of Shvat, whether we choose to engage it or not, but it's sort of like, it's happening. We're inside of it. And mm -hmm. do we, do we actively participate or not? Mm -hmm. And I think that really like Jewishness was kind of saying to me for a long time, like this, like you're in this this is happening. You're part of it, whether you intentionally engage it or not. And mostly what was happening for me was this enormous longing. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, the first Jewish event that I ever put on that was centered around a Jewish holiday was a Purim spiel, a Purim play at the Albany landfill in the Bay area. Oh. And I had just moved from the East coast to the Bay area and had had the privilege of being at the um, Chafridge, um, Ashkalashish, forgive me, I can never say your name, <laughs> this like amazing, amazing poem event that happens in New York every year, mm -hmm. happened in New York every year. And I arrived in San Francisco and Purim was coming up and I started asking around, like, where is the radical queer Purim spiel? Because I was like, somehow Purim seemed to be this place that there were, there was like radical queer Jewishness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And everybody was kind of like, I don't think there is one here. And so I decided to put one on and I put on this little Purim spiel at the Albany landfill. I think that there were three people who had a pre existing relationship to Purim in the play. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, and everybody else was sort of just like, you made me a bikini out of pantyhose and actual like preserved chicken wings with feathers. Like, how could I say no? You know, like, sure, <laughs> I'll be Easter. You know, like, that was just like, so we put on this Purim spiel and I met many people and then they met each other that day and it was sort of this magical event. And, and then the next thing that happened was I did, I hosted Passover uh, because there was, I, I felt like I needed to do Passover and I couldn't. Um, find a Haggadah that I liked at all. And so I wrote a Haggadah, you know, or pasted one together, right? And I think this is like many of our stories. Anyway, this is to say, I always go back and I'm like, what actually made me and like, which of these holidays opened the door for me to remember that I am deeply in lineage with radical, queer, mystical, witchy, very resistant Jewishness that like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm in this lineage, whether I choose to be active in it or not. And so I think, yeah, I come back to Purim again and again and think that Adar in many ways is like who opened the door for me. And it mm. makes sense because, you know, and I, I do want to honor that there's like Passover was also an important one, but um, <laughs> that when I came back to doing Purim, there was, it was a very clear recognition. Like it, it literally felt as if Adar, and I don't even think I knew that word then. Like I knew Purim, but I didn't know Adar. It was literally as if the door was being opened by, by both ancestors and descendants that reflected um, me and my highest strivings. So then I started putting on these Purim plays and this year I'm, I'm going to put on my 13th. Whoa. It's my, my bat mitzvah Lucky year. number. <laughs> totally. So that, I, I think that's all very roundabout, but yeah, that's what I'll say. Seduced that's, by Adar. That's, that's how I first met you is mm. at the Purim spiel in San Francisco. So that was the, that was my third Purim spiel, but it was the second Purim spiel that I put on with the Temple of the Coven of Our Lips, which is this coven of queer Jewish witches that that I rolled with for a long time. And we put on Purim every year. And it was our biggest, like most outward facing offering to the community. Yeah, yeah I mean, that party, I thank you for bringing me back to that one, because that one, I think, really did 
like crack something open for me further where I was like, actually like, this is real. Mm -hmm, Something mm -hmm. happens on Purim where this temple opens Mm -hmm. and there is this space where binaries dissolve and that you, you don't know the difference between up and down this or that good or bad, but also like For me, there was something about Purim where actually like this false binary that I had established in my mind where it was like, there's Jewishness over here. And then there's sort of like this very feral wildness that Mm -hmm. I have created in my queer life that's over here. And they kind of have to be separated. But actually Mm -hmm. like that event, I was like, oh no, they are really Mm -hmm. like if they are two sides of a binary it's the kind of binary that goes like this right because like that's what we actually know about all the polarities Mm -hmm. is like they are not opposite Mm -hmm. i just want to say what you're doing with your hands right now for people who are not watching um but this like really beautiful contracting and expanding hand jellyfish type (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah well you just you just i mean you're ability to capture the essence of Purim. I mean, I feel like it's rippled out and now Mm. it's just an archetype that exists. It's just an experience that exists in lots of cities, like in Mm. in Philly, in San Francisco, in New York. I don't know where, oh yeah, in Santa Fe or Tucson, someone told me about doing like a really wild one. So I think that they like Mm. happen a lot of different places now. I love thinking about all these people mm-hmm. who are throwing these Purim parties. And, you know, honestly, I have this fantasy of having a retreat mm. of people who write Purim plays. Yes. Because there's actually now, like, it's like, I am really blessed that I have gotten to now collaborate with many of them. Mm-hmm. But my my sense is exactly what you're saying, which is like, there's so many more, you know, mm-hmm. and, and this mm-hmm. is, this is part of what I love about this practice is that always in Jewish time, we're returning to the same stories and telling them over and over again. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if we're doing it um, in alignment with both who we are and who we're becoming, we're changing how we tell the story, right? Because mm-hmm. we're, we're growing mm-hmm. and we're transforming. Mm-hmm. Um, and responding but, to what's happening in the exactly. world. I think that's what's so amazing about these current iteration of Porn mm-hmm. Fields. And just to give people who are listening a little bit of background, Ilan actually wrote all of these. I mean, I, I'm assuming you also got feedback from other people, but you kind of just like channeled this like storyline and the script is that... I mean, Accurate? there was yeah. there was a lot of collaboration with different people at different okay. points. Um, Jesse, yeah. Susanna, the Many Witch, and I did like okay. very very deep collaboration. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. And always there would be a sitting sitting with people and asking the question like, mm-hmm. who is Esther this year? Who is Vashti? Mm-hmm. Like, what do we need from this story? Mm-hmm. You know, like how mm-hmm. do we see that this story is already being played out in the world. Mm -hmm. And so how are we going to use this story the way that the original Purim Spielers used it, which was like, they were like, okay, we've got this story Mm -hmm. about this heinous empire, right? Mm -hmm. And then these queens, how are we going to use this story to tell the story of what's happening right now Mm -hmm. and to communicate like underground messages and also to give people a chance to embody different roles and to flip the script, to change Mm -hmm. the story. And I like that to me is, is part of what's interesting is that we, those of us who write these plays, we write them not so that they can be read, but so they can be embodied. And for the Mm. most part, they are embodied and nobody can hear a word of what you're saying. Like, it's like, (laughs) I always like, if people come and they understand what happened, we kind of blew the opportunity. Like the the point (laughs) is to be like, really actually, you know, shake people into a different Mm -hmm. kind of sensibility, like into Mm -hmm. their senses, but not necessarily mm-hmm. into their intellect, not into their thinking mind, mm-hmm. but into like mm-hmm. their feeling, right? Into mm-hmm. their body mm-hmm. mind. And and this is the medicine mm-hmm. that we need at this time of year, you know? And I think about mm-hmm. that a lot too. Like when I think about this as like an earth-based festival, it's like, well, it just, it makes sense. Like, yeah. you know, it's the end of winter, spring has almost begun and and you feel, you know, yeah, like a fizzy beverage in a bottle with a tight cap on it. And it's like, <laughs> you're going to burst out and it, I think a lot about these winter holidays and I'm like oh like seasonal affective disorder is not new 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> like the ancestors were also like really bummed and lonely and like not sure if they wanted to like turn the wheel again and plant new seeds mm. and like mm. have fun mm. and that, that it's they like needed this... a kick in the pants totally yeah. and to be like you're actually religiously obligated to have fun right now yes. <laughs> like you know <laughs> I want to ask about, um, so when we were working on your piece for the planner, you were, it's like, you have such a deep relationship with Purim that you were kind of like, I don't know how to encapsulate this into this like couple pages. And you kind of focused on the relationship between Yom Kippur and Purim. And I wonder if you want to speak to that contrast or that relationship at all. Yeah. Thank you so much. I know it's funny. I was like, am I going to talk about that at all? Because I feel like I, I spent so much energy on it in the piece of, yeah, I I think part of it for me has to do with, um, and maybe this is unnecessary. Like maybe I don't have to get on my soapbox about this, but really understanding play as a sacred practice, Mm -hmm. really, really being like, no, 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 no. Like one might say like, oh, Purim is shallow or trite Mm. or, you know, I've heard people say, you know, in the past few years so much, like when there is so much suffering, how can Mm. we have Purim? And and I'm like, let me tell you, as the person who's trying to write this play and put this party on, it is Mm -hmm. really hard and we need Purim now more than ever. Mm -hmm. Like we need Purim not to escape the suffering, but to experience the suffering in a different way, which is through connection and through mm-hmm. play and remembering that we always have access to joy. Like we can mm-hmm. always find joy. And that doesn't mean that you have to find joy in every moment. Like we shouldn't push ourselves to do that, but that like this, this medicine is here for us. And so Purim, as it's said to be like the inverse, like the reverse mirror of, of Yom Kippur or Yom Kippurim. And I think of it as these two poles of connection to source consciousness to God. Mm -hmm. That in Yom Kippur, you have to go in, like you have to go all the way in and you don't do it alone, right? Like you Mm -hmm. go all the way in, in community with other people, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's the beautiful intimacy about engaging in this kind of prayer. It's like, we're going all the way in to meet God inside of ourselves in our own holy of holies, but we're, we're in community, whether we're physically present with people or not, right? Mm -hmm. We know people are doing it, but then on Purim, it's the opposite. You Mm -hmm. have to go out, like you, you Mm -hmm. connect outwards and, and, that can be connecting to other people, or it can just be like an outward expression. Just literally like Mm. if Yom Kippur is an inner meditation, Purim is an outer expression. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and then in the wheel of the year, it makes so much sense. Right. Um, Yom Kippur falls around the autumn equinox. We're preparing to go in for the winter. And then Mm. Purim is, you know, towards the end of winter, sometimes closer or further from the spring equinox, but is like preparing to go back out. And these sort of touch points with source consciousness and identifying that the playful one is not less holy, is not mm-hmm. less sacred. Well, people yeah. love Purim. I mean, I love it more now that I've experienced and been a part of these plays. And I, I also just want to say I have such, I admire your ability to direct these plays and to collaborate with people on it. I mean, I, I, when I lived in Philly, I co-wrote one with some people there. For some reason that year, I ended up directing it. And it's not easy. <laughs> Alana, you and I have directed together. I was just thinking what an amazing director you are. You have a lot of skill at working with people. And you're also just very allowing of what's going to happen and what people are going to do. And you're very good at it. Well, thank <laughs> that you. I mean, I think, I think this is the thing is like, it's part of what, like this kind of having to step into foolishness or like step off the cliff and mm-hmm. kind of like, I might like be embarrassed. <laughs> like, I might not know what's going on. Like, it's like entering into this childlike state where you're just like, yeah. let's play. Mm-hmm. The thing, that's the thing that I like my experience the first year that I was in the Purim Spiel that you directed, that I was Esther, I was, I discovered a whole new part of myself. 
through mm-hmm. playing that role and being a part mm-hmm. of that community. I'm mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, I'm this wild person. I mean, I knew I was a wild person, but a different part of myself. You know, that's what yeah. happens in play is we discover mm-hmm. new parts of ourselves. And there's something of the framing of how you set up those opportunities for people mm-hmm. that inspired people to let go and get to know different parts of themselves. And my, also my experience as an audience member that first time mm-hmm. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm intrigued. What is this? Who are they? <laughs> like, how do I be a part of this? Mm-hmm. Mm, I'm so I, glad that's... it worked. The spell worked. <laughs> the spell worked. I was going to say, I had known Rebecca for like many years before going to that specific Purim spiel where you were Esther and I had never seen that side of you. I was like, whoa, Rebecca is like down for just like doing a super weird improvisational <laughs> like dance performance in front of hundreds of people. I did not know that. <laughs> and this is the thing is like, it always is a play within a play. Yeah. Like it always is like, we're telling the porn story, but we're telling the story of our lives, which is the story of like, the world story, you know, but Mm. also like we are telling our own story as we are reading it, as it is being written in that moment. Like it's, it's truly ritual theater. This year I am going to, and if anybody is listening and you're doing a porn spiel, feel free to use this. I am going to actually print out my script and make little paper zines that we'll give to people when they come in. And there will be like the, the Greek chorus will be anybody can join in, but then Mm. they can take it home and actually read Mm -hmm. it because I have Mm -hmm. to say, like, I think they're worth reading. They (laughs) are worth reading. And I think it's important (laughs) that they're performed in a way where like, maybe you heard the words, maybe you did it. Maybe they said the words, maybe somebody just started speaking in tongues, Mm -hmm. like whatever happened, happened. But like there Mm -hmm. is, yeah, I'm interested in the text also having its own life. Um, which was something that I discovered the first year of the pandemic, I wrote a poem spiel and I performed it in New York and it was the last party. And I had, um, you know, I, I had a sense of what was coming in terms of, Mm -hmm. um, the, the pandemic lockdown sooner than mm-hmm. a lot of people in my community because I work in an elementary school. Mm-hmm. So we were having these conversations of like, okay, if this happens, what, what would we do? And, um, mm-hmm. so we got together for the rehearsal and I just remember saying, you know, I think we have to enter into this night. Like it's, it could be the last time we're all together for a really long time. Mm. Wow. And it was, it was, wow. it was the last party, but so I had the script mm-hmm. and then, um, Kohenet had asked me if I would do a little Purim something for the Saturday night program for our upcoming retreat. So this was separate. Mm -hmm. And then of course that upcoming retreat ended up being online. Mm -hmm. It was the first, you know, Kohenet pandemic online retreat. Mm -hmm. And I had the script and so I adapted it for Zoom. Oh, I remember that. Mm -hmm. And then we did the same not the same, but like a version of of the Mm -hmm. Purim show that I just put on in person. And there were a bunch of people who were in both or who were at both. Mm-hmm. And people were like, wow, it was amazing to actually hear the script. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, yeah, now I, now that I've had um, the, yeah, the blessing of the online experience, I now I'm, I'm, I'm ready to, to have the performance be chaotic mm-hmm. enough that we might not hear the words, but the mm-hmm. words get to live on their own. Mm. Well, I remember at that online um, poem spiel that you talked about the possibilities of theater online on Zoom. And that was like really inspiring to me and led me to do a number of different kinds, different ways of using the technology in order to have theatrical productions that happened during quarantine. And so thank you for introducing that idea to my brain and for modeling it and then participating in so many ways. That was mm, like thank you. really helpful as a way to connect. Yeah. You guys, we're like almost out of time and we yeah. haven't had so many parts of this conversation. Yeah. There was a lot I'm to say. If if you want to just share anything about your visions of the world to come. Yeah, I, I would say the practice that I am in right now is just really trying to stay present with the idea that the Olam Haba, that the world to come, that the world that we are 
are hoping to call in that it's already here. Mm. And I think, you know, my, I'm very lucky because I work with children. So they are constantly representing the world to come. Mm -hmm. Um, And if I can say like what I see in them, it is powerful. Like Mm. the will of the world to come is strong. It is Mm. radiant. It is impatient. It is stubborn. (laughs) It is pushy. It is loud. It's really loud. It's, like, <laughs> it's got wild movement and mm. it's passionate yeah. and it's strong mm. and it's bright and it's playful and it's funny. Like it's <laughs> like really, really funny. And yeah, what I see in my students are human beings who are deeply, deeply committed to living in community with each other, who really understand that they're that by being in, in connection and being in community mm-hmm. and being in abundance and sharing resource, mm-hmm. that this is a path that is life affirming. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's very, very sweet and very noisy mm-hmm. what I see <laughs> in the world to come, which is already here. Um, yeah. oh, I love Thank that. You. Thank you for um, taking time to talk with us. It was such you. a delight. It's thank such you. a delight. I could talk to you for a long time. Well, and... thank you for inviting me. This was very fun. I'm no longer intimidated of podcasts. You're and natural. I want to say, I want to say also just really <laughs> thank you for your work. Thank you, Alon. Thank you. Myrtle meditation. Take a few breaths in, feeling your body relax, welcoming in Myrtle. Myrtle with their evergreen thick waxy leaves shaped like eyes. Myrtle helps us grow our love for justice. Another name for Queen Esther is Hadassah, the name of our beloved Myrtle tree. Breathe into your bones, your strength. your commitment to justice, the flowers of myrtle mirror the morning star and the stamens reach towards the star. This star tree, like Venus and Ishtar, the goddess of love, reminds us of the courage it takes to love deeply, to love ourselves and others so much that we do things we're scared to do. For love of justice and freedom. Feel the strength of your bones and your spine, your skeleton holding your skin sack together, and find a place inside yourself where you desire to reach towards the stars. And in that desire, See if you can find love and hope that can overcome fear and give you the courage to take a risk towards freedom and justice. And feel Myrtle crowning your head your crown, beckoning the stars energy into your body to give you strength. 
Thank you, Myrtle. And now it's time for This Way to Alam Haba, a segment where we talk about people and projects that feel like guideposts in leading us toward the world that we want to live in. And this month we're talking about Raven Wings. Raven Wings, the Black Widow of Burlesque, is a Tanzanian, Bermudian, Mohawk, two-spirit, queer, and transcendent empowerment storyteller. Raven's an abolitionist and co-founder of Il Nana, Diverse City Dance Company. She's a Canadian best-selling author, one of the top 25 women of influence in Canada from 2021, and a co-founder of Black Lives Matter Canada. She serves on the steering team of the Black Lives Matter Toronto chapter, a group committed to eradicating all forms of anti-Black racism and to supporting Black healing and liberating Black communities. And we wanted to talk about Raven Wings today because she's amazing and we want to lift up her work and also because we see a lot of parallels to her work with the archetype of Esther and the story of Esther. Yeah, she has said in a few different places, um, I'm actually going to read a quote from a piece that she has on, it's called artistsandpresidents.com and um, we'll, we'll link to this in the show notes, but she says, I was convinced I had nothing to offer the revolution and my people. I couldn't be a leader. Not this soft-hearted, naive, high femme, queer, and positive burlesque artist. And when I read that, I thought of things that Esther says in the poem story, where she's mm-hmm. like, I'm not a, a spokesperson for our people. Like, she was not trying to put herself in a position to, you know, be a revolutionary or a leader in that way. Um, but that is what her life offered her and, and what she stepped into. And I I really see that in Raven's work. And I love how she brings her feminist and queerness and artistry into her activism. Like, um, if you research her, you'll see examples like there was an action she was involved with that involved putting hot pink paint on these colonizer statues. And she's like, oh, you know, we tried all the other things and you didn't pay attention. So this got your attention. And it's beautiful. I love bringing that playfulness into really serious things. And you can, yeah, you can learn more. We'll put links in the show notes to learn more about her work. And you support her work by supporting any work to defund the police and the abolition work too. I learned about her work from Cyrus Marcus Ware who did an illustration of her for the Sins Invalid coloring book that Rebecca has art in and that I curated. And so we'll put a link to that too. If you want to see a picture of her, you can go and color Cyrus's her Cyrus's work is very, they're constantly putting out all these really awesome memes. And oh yeah, really fun follow on Instagram. Yeah, yeah follow Raven, follow Cyrus Marcus Ware, and, um, and follow Sins Invalid too. Yes. Patreon. Patreon is a thing that you can sign up for. Oh, Patreon. You can sign up. Sign you can up. also call it a Matreon if you want to, or a Gatreon, or a Ga- Patreon. <laughs> Gatreon. Matreon. Matreon. They Join our Patreon now. <laughs> <laughs> we would really appreciate it. We love all our Patreon people. Thank you so much for supporting mm-hmm. us. Yes. <laughs> and thank you also for being patient with us for putting out this episode late this month. We really love you and we want to talk to you. And sometimes it takes us longer than we thought it would. Chag Sameach Porum. Chag Sameach. Mwah. Mwah. 
Macht euf, macht euf, macht euf, macht euf, und lost unser Rhein, und lost unser Rhein, und wisst ihr, wer es kennt, o sein. Oi, 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 erste Hamalka, die ganze Welt, Heinz ist pur in mir gehen verstellt. Erste Hemmelke die ganze Welt, Heinz ist pur in mir gehen verstellt. Oi, oi, bam, 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 oi, oi, bam, 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 bam. Macht euf, macht euf, macht euf, macht euf, und lost unser Rhein, und lost unser Rhein. Wisst ihr, wer es kennt, o sein? Oh, wasch die Hamalka, die ganze Welt. Heinz ist pur in mir gehen verstellt. Wasch die Hamalka, die ganze Welt. Heinz ist pur in mir gehen verstellt. Oi, oi, bam, 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 bam. Oi, oi, bam, 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 bam. Macht euf, macht euf, macht euf, macht euf und lost unser Rhein und lost unser Rhein. Wisst ihr, wer es kennt, o sein? Lana Hamalka, die ganze Welt, Heinz ist pur in mir gehen verstellt. Lana Hamalka, die ganze Welt, Heinz ist pur in mir gehen verstellt. Oi. Bom 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 bom, oi oi. Bom 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 bom, oi oi. Bom 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 bom, oi oi. Bom 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 bom.